Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Matos. I am the director of the Glaze Consortium, Greenhouse Lighting and Systems Engineering Consortium. Excited, super excited uh, to, to be holding this roundtable today uh, with six new CEA professors uh, here in the US. Uh, I think this conversation is going to be very interesting. We're going to have the opportunity to learn about what they're doing, where they're doing, uh, the research programs, and hopefully uh, make connections and, and provide good exposure for the industry. Uh, so new attendees can get to know the new professors and the new professors have the opportunity to talk about their work uh, to this broad audience. If you have any questions, let us know. Uh, be happy to make the connections afterwards, any specific emails or anything like that. I can make the connection between the audience and the new researchers. Uh, so just to start a brief overview, the, the Glaze Consortium webinar series uh, is a selection of live recorded webinars uh, in which we try to bring leading CA researchers, leading industry experts to connect with the industry on relevant topics uh, that we see uh, with greenhouses and indoor farms. Today, we have six professors, six young professors talking here. Uh, we're gonna be hearing from Dr. Kelly Walters, professor at the University of Tennessee, Dr. Xu Yang Zhen, from Texas AAM, uh, Dr. William Meng from University of Delaware, Dr. Garrett Owen from University of Kentucky, Dr. Josh Graver from Colorado State University, and Dr. Eugene Park from Arizona State University. A recorded version of this webinar will be available again, like I just said, at the Glaze website. Uh, and if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A box. It's much easier for me later on to track the questions and make sure I respond to everyone. If you send to the chat box, we're gonna read them, but there is a risk that it might just get lost. Uh, so just, just let me know about that. Uh, I think I just, I did something on my computer. There you go, here's the presentation. Uh, we're ready to start. So uh, let's start with the first one. It is Dr. Eugene Park. Dr. Eugene, go ahead. Thanks, Erico. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Yujin Park and I'm an assistant professor at Arizona State University. Next please, Erico. Yes, yeah, so I joined ASU in August 2019 and my teaching and research program is under the College of Integrative Science and Art. So here I teach four horticultural courses, two courses per semester. And my research program is focusing on sustainable crop production in the uh, indoor vertical farms and greenhouses. Currently, I have four ongoing research projects. So today, I'd like to briefly introduce what I'm working on. Next, please. Yes, so the first project I'm working on is investigating the utility of sustainable organic fertilizer derived from food waste to grow a uh, hydroponic leafy green in the vertical farm. So in this project, I'm uh, collaborating with a startup company, Homer Farm and ASU Dining Hall. So ASU Dining Hall provide the food waste to the Homer Farm and Homer Farm process it to a concentrated fertilizer. And my research group is testing the effects of food waste fertilizer on plant growth in leafy greens. So eventually we aim to build a circular economy for food on ASU campus and beyond. Next, please. Yeah, and our early research with Argula and Lettuce show that leafy greens can be grown with food waste fertilizer, but compared to a, the uh, chemical fertilizer at the same EC condition, uh, food waste fertilizer provided about 60% or lower nitrogen and subsequently produced smaller plants. So currently we are uh, working on improving the efficacy of food waste fertilizer by root zone management and uh, the use of microorganisms. Next, please. <clears throat> yeah, in the vertical farm, we are also investigating uh, the effects of uh, controlling the sewer source lighting condition on plant growth and fruit quality in strawberries. So compared to lettuce and other leafy greens, relatively few study investigated the merits from the controlling the light quantity, quality, and photo period in strawberry, especially under the indoor vertical farm condition. And next, please. Our primary preliminary study uh, where we investigated the effects of increasing light intensity and photo period with uh, 
they need to also very cultivate RDO, show that increasing light intensity or PPFD and photo period both can increase the shoot and root growth of strawberry. And next, during the uh, fruit development, we observed that increasing uh, photo period from 12 to 16 hours can accelerate the fruit development by um, 12 to 12, 12, 20, 30 days, and also increase the fruit fresh weight significantly in the, uh, suggesting the value of optimizing the lighting condition for indoor strawberry production. Next, please. And in a, a for a greenhouse project uh, in collaboration with UBQD, uh, we are testing the effects of using a luminescent greenhouse film on strawberry production. So the luminescent greenhouse film is shown as an orange color film in this photo. And it converts a portion of UV and blue light into the green and red light. And during the uh, winter trial, when we compare the, this luminescent greenhouse film with a typical uh, transparent greenhouse film, uh, we observe that under uh, both film type, strawberry plants grow similarly, but the uh, fruits produced under a, this luminescent greenhouse film uh, had higher fresh weight under lower DLI condition, in, uh, suggesting that this luminescent greenhouse film can improve the uh, strawberry fruit quality under low light condition. Next, please. Yeah, in another greenhouse project, uh, I'm working with a local industrial hemp grower to improve the uh, seed germination and seedling establishment of industri industrial hemp, uh, while specifically looking at the effects of soil type, nutrient concentration, and irrigation on germination and seedling growth. So far, uh, we've, uh, found, we find that the industrial hemp germinate better with the silty room than, uh, than uh, sandy room, and in, in increasing the nutrient concentration from EC1 to 2 can increase the leaf development, chlorophyll concentration, and shoot and root biomass accumulation in the industrial hemp transplants. Next, please. Yeah, so uh, ASU has been very supportive for indoor farming education and research so far. And in next 2022 four semester, we are launching a new indoor farming certificate program to the students as well as a uh, working professional. So if you are interested in uh, education in indoor farming program or research program, please feel free to contact us. Thanks, Eugene. Thank you. All right. Um, so the acknowledgments. Next one, Josh Craver from Colorado State. All right. Thanks so much. Um, so yeah, I'm Joshua Craver. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture at Colorado State University. And so I'm going to be trying to just do a really brief overview of our controlled environment horticulture research program um, that I've established there at CSU. So uh, next slide. So the background for the CSU, the Controlled Environments Research Program is really we're looking to evaluate plant responses to the controlled environment and then utilize that information to optimize the timing and extent of production inputs to improve the efficient and sustainable use of natural resources and then also to increase crop productivity and quality. And so we have a, a joint approach to our projects, looking at both very applied research, but also trying to understand the basic physiology behind those uh, plant responses to, again, a better feed into new and novel applications. So next slide. So what I'm gonna do is just go through uh, four different projects that we currently have ongoing uh, in my program, just try to give a very uh, high level overview of some of the work that we're doing there. Um, I've also, just to save time, included the acknowledgments for each of these projects at the bottom um, of each slide, and I'll also address the grad students for each project. So the first one I'd like to go over is some work that we've been doing involving CO2 enrichment. And so we know that plants are going to respond favorably to elevated CO2. Um, right now, ambient CO2 outdoors is somewhere between 415 to about 420 parts per million. Uh, but we know that plants will respond positively to elevated uh, CO2 concentrations up to about 800 to 1200 parts per million, depending on the species. However, what we found with previous research, as well as some of the research we're currently doing, is that plants will potentially acclimate to this environment over time. And so that initial benefit that you may get from elevated CO2 
may not be sustained throughout the entire production period. And so a lot of the work that we're currently doing is really trying to better understand how we can use this input efficiently and optimize that input and the timing of that input to really be able to overcome any potential detrimental acclimation responses to really benefit growth and photosynthesis. Um, next slide. And so uh, we do this uh, both looking at growth responses as well as looking at gas exchange or leaf level photosynthesis. And so you can see my student, David McKinney, um, he just graduated this past spring. Um, he's been using this gas exchange system to really help us to better understand um, these uh, responses to CO2. And so you'll see in the top left, um, an example of a, a ACI curve where we're looking at photosynthesis on the Y and the CO2 concentration on the X axis. And we can use this to, again, better understand how plants are acclimating over time and how we can use this input more efficiently. Next slide. We're also part of a larger USDA project, Project LAMP, which stands for Lighting Approaches to Maximize Profits. And so uh, the grand uh, goal of this project is really to develop lighting strategies to optimize crop growth and quality in cost-effective ways, or really that's the area that we've been working on in my lab. And so we have a handful of uh, projects. Some of the current research we're doing is involving uh, far red lighting and really looking at how we can use far red light um, efficiently throughout the production period at various times. And so an example of this would be, if you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see some examples of uh, plugs. And so early during, um, after germination, during plug production, uh, we know that we have very small leaves. We don't have a very substantial leaf area. And so we're not able to use light quite as efficiently. And so what we've been looking at is how we can, um, both in plugs as well as other crops, use far red light strategically to try to increase that leaf area expansion, increase leaf area index to overall increase our efficiency of using either sole source or supplemental lighting. We've also uh, been doing some work looking at interactions between uh, light quality as well as temperature, so specifically far red and temperature, to again, better understand some of these responses and how they can be used strategically throughout production. And so if you look at the top right picture there, you can see my student, Anthony Percival, manipulating one of our lights in uh, one of the growth chambers that we're using for some of this work. Next slide. We also do uh, some work with some local growers. And so this is a project that's um, been supported by Altius Farms down in Denver, Colorado. They're a rooftop greenhouse that is currently using these vertical hydroponic towers. And what they found is that's caused a slew of issues in terms of production consistency and um, just uniformity in terms of crop growth. And so we've been working with them as well as with a local lighting company, SpectraGrow, to really try to develop some supplemental lighting strategies that are gonna help them to optimize their production and so you can see an example of one of those installations there. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I believe you'll see a, a photo of um, the grad student who's been working on that project, Harley Combs, um, and has been going down to Denver to uh, assist again with that installation and data collection we've been doing there. And then uh, one more uh, slide advance. And so the last thing I wanna talk about is some of the teaching research that we do. So I'm also um, passionate about the scholarship of teaching and learning. I have a, a actual majority teaching appointment here at CSU. And so um, what we found is that over the past year and a half, we've really had some hiccups in terms of teaching due to the pandemic, as I know every university has. Um, and one of the things we uh, certainly try to strive for, as well as I know is common in most horticulture programs across the, the country, is trying to give students hands-on experience. And so what we've been looking at with some recent funding is trying to create immersive experiences using virtual reality applications, and really to better understand how we can enhance student learning and provide teaching options when we know that in-person opportunities might be limited for a variety of factors, whether that's a pandemic or travel restrictions, whatever that might be. And so we're really excited about some of the work we're getting started here to hopefully not, be, not replace the experience that students are getting in the greenhouse, but really supplement that and provide an additional slew of opportunities um, to again, enhance that learning environment. And so, um, yeah, so that's uh, hopefully just a brief overview of some of the research we're doing in my lab. And uh, with that, you can pass it on to the next one. Thanks, Josh. Very interesting. We have the next speaker is Dr. Garrett Owen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Garrett Owen, and I'm an assistant extension professor in the Department of Horticulture at the University of Kentucky. Next slide, please. So in the next five minutes or so, I'm going to basically discuss my background and how that um, influences my teaching extension and research program here in the University of Kentucky. Next slide, please. So in general, with my background, I started my own greenhouse business when I was in high school as the FFA project and continued that business on during my undergraduate and master's degree. 
And during my master's degree at North, or excuse me, my bachelor's degree at North Carolina State University, I also interned at Rockwell Farms, which is a 30 plus acre greenhouse operation in Rockwell, North Carolina, where I was over about five to six acres of greenhouse production. And with these two experiences, that's kind of launched me in terms of where I really wanted to focus in my career. Next slide, please. So once earning my master's degree, I went to Purdue University and was under the direction of Dr. Roberto Lopez, where I served as his research technician and earned my PhD at the same time, where I gained experience working in different areas of uh, research environments and also different crops as well. Next slide, please. So in 2017, I joined the Department of Horticulture at Michigan State University as a floriculture and outreach specialist with also a research appointment. I was located off campus in Novi, Michigan, which is the suburbs of Metro Detroit area, where I worked 85% of the time with over 300 growers in that area and also had a 15% research appointment where I was trying to solve or investigate um, environmental and cultural production challenges that growers in that area were experiencing. Next slide, please. In May of 2020, I joined the Department of Horticulture with a three-way split with teaching, outreach, and extension. Uh, if you notice, my distribution of effort is over 100% because I also have a 5% service appointment to the university as well. Next slide, please. So when I started in May of 2020, I developed the University of Kentucky Controlled Environment Research Unit with a uh, holistic approach, integrating teaching, extension, and research to not only pioneer um, the horticulture industry in Kentucky for controlled environments, but also here in the U.S. as well. Next slide, please. So I have a teaching appointment where I teach on, fall, or excuse me, the fall of odd years, greenhouse and controlled environment structures, operation and management. And this is now part of the UK hemp certificate that is being offered. Next slide. And then in fall of even years, I teach greenhouse, floral, food and specialty crop production. And again, this is part of the UK hemp certificate as well. Next slide. And then last, I had created a uh, experience for student and faculty exchanges between Fontes and Haas University's Applied Sciences in the Netherlands to um, come over to the uh, University of Kentucky and work with us, and then have the experience of working at the App Harvest facilities as well. Next slide. My extension appointment is rather large. Not only is it myself, but we have a controlled environment extension associate that helps me uh, out on grower visits, creating educational program and electronic resources. So today we still host uh, in-person grower um, visits, educational programming, field days, but also I help coordinate eGrow to make sure that eGrow edible alerts, ornamental alerts are sent out along with the blogs. And then I'm also the leader for Furt, Dirt, and Squirt, which is a nutritional monitoring website as a uh, part of eGro as well. Next slide, please. And then my research area focuses on three main areas, um, cultivar evaluation, diversity, and adaptability of different crops that are not traditionally grown for greenhouse production and or in those production type systems, plant production in general, looking at growth regulation and energy efficiency and nutrition as well. Next slide. So my research appointment is split between 50% food crops and 50% ornamentals with the focus in food crops being on greenhouse cucumbers and vining crops that are traditionally or non-traditionally grown in greenhouses. Next slide. And here's an example of a cultivar evaluation where we are evaluating commercially available long English mini and snack type uh, greenhouse cucumbers, along with field type for adapting them to greenhouse conditions. Next slide, please. And along with the nutrition and the extension aspect is developing uh, crop specific nutrient specific deficiency or toxicity guides um, for growers and leaf tissue sufficiency ranges by chronological age and critical values. And that is demonstrated here with uh, greenhouse cucumbers. Next slide. 
And then in terms of the ornamental side, um, we are not only investigating ornamental bedding plants, potted plants, herbaceous perennials, and um, nursery stock. So here's an example of the uh, just a nitrogen study or fertility study that we have performed on over 20 different species of succulents. Next slide, please. And then in terms of plant growth regulators to control growth, we are evaluating uh, new cultivars and also new chemical um, formulations and concentrations. Uh, again, from anything from annual bedding plants to nursery stock as well. Next slide, please. And then these are all the organizations and private companies that have supported our current initiatives and ongoing initiatives to date. And that will be it. Thanks, Garrett. Our next speaker, there you go, Xu Yang Zhen. Um, good afternoon. My name is Xu Yang Zhen. I'm an assistant professor in the horticulture department at Texas A&M. Um, I've been here for a little bit less than 10 months, um, so today I won't have much data to share with you, but just to give you a quick overview of my research program. And I, my appointment here is 60% research, 30% teaching, and 10% service. Uh, next, please. Uh, so my overall research objective is to optimize production of specialty crop in control environment. And the goal is to make production more profitable for growers and also to promote adoption of new and improved production approaches. Uh, one specific focus area is to optimize photosynthetic efficiency and crop yield. Um, right now, I'm trying to put together a whole canopy gas exchange system. And I have used a similar system uh, for my postdoc research at Utah State University. So the beauty of this system is that we can actually use it to study um, the photosynthetic responses to dynamic changes of environmental conditions um, at canopy level over long term. And related to um, this focus area, I have a PhD student um, right now looking at uh, how uh, blue light effect on photosynthesis under fluctuating light. And we are especially interested in water use efficiency uh, because it can actually take a huge amount of energy to dehumidify in indoor farms. Uh, next, please. And the other area I'm interested in is to improve secondary uh, metabolite production and nutritional value of food crops. Uh, I'm currently setting up two experiments uh, in collaboration with uh, a colleague specialized in food quality uh, to look at how UV radiation affect growth and phytochemical production in arugula and also fruit quality of greenhouse grown tomato. Um, also, one thing I learned very quickly after I moved to Texas is it is really hot and humid here. Um, so, so uh, um, as you can imagine, greenhouses are not a very popular place to be in in summertime, and that's the same for um, uh, crops, uh, especially many varieties of leafy grains. Uh, so right now, I'm working on developing a project to enhance the heat, heat tolerance of leafy grain production using hydroponics in greenhouses. And this is in collaboration with colleagues here in Texas and also um, from University of Florida, University of Georgia, and University of Arkansas. Uh, next, please. Um, so uh, this is the, basically the only piece of data I wanted to share with you today. Uh, this study looks at the interaction between light and temperature um, by my PhD student, Sandrine Zhang. Um, so from the top to bottom, uh, we're looking at increasing fraction of far right. And from left to right, uh, we're seeing increasing temperature from 20 degrees C uh, to 28 degrees C, and also two treatments of DIF. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but just wanted to point out that interactions 
between or among uh, environmental factors are not very well understood, but they can have a huge impact on crop growth. And in the next slide, um, you can also see that uh, different species will respond very differently to the same environmental condition. Um, and next, please. And so the last thing I wanted to share with you today is a dis really a discussion on uh, far red photons and whether they are photosynthetically active. I believe many of you in the audience are aware of the recent decision by the Design Lights Consortium uh, to not include far red photons in the measurement of horticultural fixture efficiency. Um, they are very keen to reference some of my previous research uh, with Dr. Mark Van Erso and Bruce Buckby, um, but it happens that we do not agree with their interpretation or their decision. So we decided to respond and uh, explain our disagreement and also why we actually think far-red photons should be included in the definition of photosynthetic photons and also the measurement of horticultural fixture efficacy. Um, this is a very short article and we really appreciate your feedback. If you can leave your comment on the journal website, I will become part of a public discussion. And um, we look forward to having uh, your feedback. And thank you. And that's all for me today. Thank you, Yan. Our next speaker will be William. Hello, everyone. My name is Qin Wu William Meng. I'm an assistant professor of controlled environment horticulture in the Department of Plant and Soil Sciences at the University of Delaware. Uh, my appointment is 55% research, 40% teaching, and 5% department service. I'm specialized in lighting applications and environmental control for crops grown in indoor vertical farms and greenhouses. I also teach hydroponic food production and controlled environment crop physiology and technology. My career has been at the intersection of horticultural lighting and CEA. I have a bachelor's degree in agricultural engineering from China Agricultural University and master's and PhD degrees in horticulture from Michigan State University. And my graduate advisor was Dr. Eric Ronco. In the last year, I have developed the Delaware Indoor Ag Lab or DIAL on our campus. DIAL is a brand new research facility that supports a variety of research foci in controlled environments with an emphasis on LED lighting. I have a team of three graduate students, an undergraduate student, and a greenhouse manager. Our research aims to address scientific questions on environmental plant physiology and production problems faced by controlled environment growers. There are three sections in DIAL with unique capabilities. Next slide, please. First, we have the ability to control light quality, quantity, and duration with the Ostrom Phytophy RL LED fixtures. When I was doing my PhD in the Controlled Environment Lighting Laboratory, or CELL, at Michigan State University, I worked with Dr. Eric Kronko and engineers from Ostrom to test these fixtures for indoor horticultural lighting research. Here in DIAL, we can create six lighting treatments with three fixtures per treatment on growing racks. In each fixture, there are six color channels that can be independently controlled, including UVA, blue, green, red, far red, and warm white. We can use flexible growing systems depending on the research, such as hydroponic floating rafts and standing systems. We will use this setup to optimize light quality, quantity, and duration for various crops. Next slide, please. The second section in DIAL allows us to adjust the intensity and duration of white LEDs. I worked with a company called Demongro to develop these custom LED fixtures. We can communicate with the fixtures using a smartphone app via Bluetooth and set the desired light intensity and duration. There are a total of 12 dimming zones. We will use this system to study dynamic control of light intensity and photo period in vegetable transplants, including tomatoes, 
leafy greens, and fruiting crops. Next slide, please. Next to the racks, we also have four reaching growth chambers from Percival Scientific. These growth chambers provide us with more precise environmental control. There is a touchscreen interface for each chamber to control and monitor the temperature, relative humidity, and CO2 concentration. So for each of these parameters, we can deliver up to four levels. In addition, the two vertical tiers in each chamber are equipped with adjustable LED arrays with four independent color channels, including blue, green, red, and far red. So we can create two different lighting treatments per chamber and up to eight lighting treatments with all four chambers. What's unique is that we can study how light quality interacts with temperature, relative humidity, and CO2 concentration. And it sounds like uh, we have some research in that direction uh, from uh, our peers already uh, from Shuya. This will allow us to uh, optimize these environmental factors altogether. Next slide, please. Besides dial, we also conduct crop research in our greenhouse. Currently, we're working on photoperiodic lighting to control flowering of chrysanthemum and long day floriculture crops. In addition, I'd like to pursue greenhouse projects on hydroponic leafy greens and fruiting crops. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank our funding agencies, including HRI, AFE, and NASA, and industry partners, including Demingro, Groden, GR Peters, and Lucas Greenhouses for supporting my new research program. Our lab is an hour to Philadelphia or Baltimore and two hours to New York City or Washington DC. With so many CEA activities here on the East Coast, I hope my applied research in Delaware will help nearby CEA growers and beyond, and I welcome collaborations. If you would like to follow up with me, please email me at qwmeng at uda.edu and follow us on social media. Our website is indooraglab.com. Our social media handle is indooraglab on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's great to make new connections here and see what everyone is working on. And thank you so much for having me today. Thanks, William. Our next presenter, it is Dr. Kelly Walters. Awesome. Last, but hopefully not least. Um, yeah, so my name is Kelly Walters. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee. Uh, so I just started September 1st in this position, so less than a full year. So kind of in the similar boat to Shuyan at Texas A&M there. So today I'll be sharing a little bit about uh, mainly our facilities because we don't have a lot of, of research up and ready to present yet. Um, but a little bit about my appointment, I am 85% research, so rather high research percentage, and 15% teaching. So I teach a plant physiology and nutrition course for undergraduates, and I will be teaching a plant physiology course for graduate students, as well as advising um, some undergraduates in the plant science major. Next slide, please. So an outline of the talk today, the overall goal of my lab and my research. Then we'll again discuss some of the facilities and then a little bit of recent work that we have um, conducted. Next slide, please. So the overall goal is to leverage environmental conditions like temperature, carbon dioxide concentration, light, quantity, duration, quality, like many others today have, have discussed, and the different cultural factors like plant hormones, plant growth regulators, uh, nutrient solutions and watering. To and use all of these uh, to improve controlled environment agriculture. So specific things that we want to improve or maybe not so specific uh, production efficiencies, uh, yield, and then quality. So one thing that I am focusing on that um, is a little bit different uh, than the others that spoke today is uh, the quality of the crop. And so I'll show some pictures of our lab and some things that we are quantifying and we are very interested in improving in the context of controlled environment agriculture. Next slide, please. So I started September 1st. We have two awesome undergrads. Everything's up and running in the greenhouse. It's just nice to see your first research plants. Um, we had our first data collection. A couple days later, an undergrad calls me and says, Dr. Walters, 
I'm COVID positive. Um, so we were all working together with this big data collection and with masks and everything, but then we had to let all of the plants die. But that's okay because next slide. We got back up going again. And yeah, we've grown a lot of plants um, since you know even January. So some of the facilities, we have a nice greenhouse here. Um, and the top left, uh, we built some deep flow technique or raft hydroponic systems. Uh, so they don't look fancy, but they're really customizable. I can change the size of them to really grow whatever for whatever experiment we're working on. Um, in the bottom left, we have some ebb and flow systems that we have been using, um, especially for some of our seedling research. Um, in the middle there, we have some tubs. We've been uh, working on some nutrient solution studies. And in the bottom right, we have some nutrient film technique systems that we've been using uh, for some of our greenhouse and indoor comparisons, especially with different cultivars. Next slide, please. We also have several growth chambers. So starting up in that top left, we have some Conviron, four Conviron reaching growth chambers um, that we've recently, well, not we, uh, I mean my graduate student, Jessica Curtis, who started in January. She is installing some uh, Fluence LED fixtures. So that's her in the bottom left there, um, happily after installing her, her first chamber of lights. Um, and then we have in the middle there some of her initial research. This was just taken a couple of days ago in the chamber. Um, on the right here, we have a walk-in growth chamber that we move some of the systems from the greenhouse into this chamber so we can do some greenhouse and indoor comparisons. In the center here, we have two undergraduates at the top, Dustin Del Moro. He really led some of this initial research over the winter holiday break. He and I were working 70 hours a week just trying to get some research together. So he was a trooper in getting the lab set up. And then the bottom is Maddie Spradley. So she's been helping out as well. Uh, next slide, please. We also have a fresh electric farm, which is a big shipping container. And it doesn't, a shipping container doesn't seem that big until you have to clean the whole thing. Um, and that's what Sarah Parker, my research associate, uh, would tell you. She is also getting her PhD co-advised with Carl Sams. And her research is taking place in this fresh electric farm. You can see how excited she is here uh, with getting everything up and going. So next slide, please. Uh, one thing I would like to feature is our awesome lab. So I mentioned before that Sarah Parker is my research associate. Uh, she has her uh, master's in plant sciences, but she worked mainly with secondary metabolites and broccoli post-harvest. So she has um, very great experience with uh, secondary metabolite quantification. And we have some nice lab space and lab equipment here. Uh, so I wanted to feature the HPLC in the top left there. Um, we are excited to be able to quantify specific carotenoids and chlorophylls. Um, you can see in the center bottom, Spencer Givens. He's an undergraduate working this summer in the lab who was very excited about carotenoid extractions. And I thought, oh, maybe he'll want to go into the greenhouse to do some work this summer. So he's not only in the lab, but he assures me that he is very happy just to work in the lab. So he's been a great asset there. Um, but we're also excited to investigate um, not only nutritional compounds like carotenoids and glucosinolates and uh, total anthocyanins on the spectrophotometer here, but also uh, continue some of the work that I've done previously with uh, volatiles that contribute to flavor and aroma of plants. So a lot of our work is pairing you know, production practices uh, with these secondary metabolites and quantifying the quality of the crop. Next slide, please. So uh, just a general overview of the recent work, we've mainly been focusing on leafy greens and herbs um, lately, but we've been working on studies regarding nutrient solution management, dynamic environmental control um, at the beginning of production, at the end of production in particular, um, cultivar attribute changes in indoors versus in greenhouses. And all of this is centered around improving yield and crop quality. Next slide, please. So I wanted to share one study uh, that uh, we recently presented at the ISHS Lighting Symposium with uh, purple lettuce seedlings. 
So you can see here at the top, the seedlings appeared very differently. So at the left, uh, 60 micromoles of light for a 24 hour photo period. Um, going to the right, 600 micromoles for a 24 hour photo period. Next slide, please. What we found, oh no, the graph, the graph disappeared. Um, okay, well, this one was with ceiling. Oh, sorry, Kelly, it, that, that's not the same one. Uh, no, sorry. it's not the same one. It's different, uh, but that's okay. But seedling okay, fresh sorry. mass increased. That's okay. Um, Erico did a great job of putting all the slides together. So we had to have something like this happen, right? Um, but seedling fresh mass increased by 275% as the light intensity increased from 60 to 600 micromoles. Um, next slide, please. So as you can tell you know, by the picture, anthocyanin concentration also increased as well up to about 400 micromoles. Um, next slide, please. But when you transplanted them into the greenhouse and grew out the, the lettuce, um, we only saw benefits from seed, increasing that seedling light intensity up to about 200 micromoles it, regarding fresh mass. There was no difference in anthocyanin concentrations. Um, next slide, please. So with that, I'd just like to thank everybody who helped get the lab up and going and is continuing to do the research. I know they're all harvesting today and all of the different organizations that have helped uh, fund the research that we are conducting. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, go ahead, if you can find that uh, graphic that was missing, if you can pull that over, we can, we can bring today's screen here in a second. Uh, meanwhile, I can acknowledge and thanks uh, all these speakers. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's an incredible opportunity for the CA industry in general. Uh, having so many new research programs in the US, uh, I think all of you presented the capabilities, opportunities to partnership, uh, not only on research, but extension, educational. Uh, it's fantastic uh, to have a group of young professors and an exciting set of research. I think the whole industry looks forward uh, to learn more and hopefully establish partnerships with all your programs. Uh, Kelly, do you have this slide? Do you want to show this slide? Sure. So let me stop my screen and now you can try to share yours. I didn't want to try to do this a longer presentation and make it even worse. <laughs> oh, no worries. Yeah, it's just simple, you know, increasing as light intensity increases. But, you know, this doesn't really matter if it doesn't persist through, through harvest, though. So that's what we were hoping that, you know, we could increase this light intensity at the seedling phase because you can only increase it so much uh, when you're finishing lettuce. Otherwise, you'll get tip burns. So we were hoping that we could really, you know, nuke them with light at the, you know, early stages and avoid that tip burn issue, but we weren't super successful, so. Thanks. All right, so uh, I've been making notes and I have a few questions for all of you. We have about 15 minutes. Uh, we've got some questions through the Q&A, through the message box here, which I have to pull up in front of me. There you are. Uh, so. Let's see what we can do within, within these next uh, 15 minutes. Uh, Eugene, with the first presentation, one of the questions that we had is, they talk about using food waste uh, as a fertilizer for the new crops, right? Uh, have you guys thought about aquaponics? Is that related to aquaponics where you have the animal waste? Uh, so any correlations there, anything that could be integrated, any parallels to aquaponic systems? Those, the characteristic, the nutrient composition characteristic is similar between food waste fertilizer and uh, aquaponic nutrient solution. But here we don't have expert in fish. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but we have the uh, expert in the waste management uh, expert. So uh, we don't work on the aquaponic, but we only focus on the food waste fertilizer. Thanks, Erica. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Uh, then. The other question I had was for Josh. Josh, you mentioned two things here that I thought was very interesting. Uh, I will pick one in the interest of time and then we can go back to the second one if we have more time. Uh, so talk about increasing CO2 levels, right? Impacts, how they can acclimate. So the general question there would be, uh, how do you see the long impacts with the CO2 levels increasing around the world? Uh, how do you think the plants will adapt to that? What is the impact on, on the commercial crops? Yeah, and sorry, you, you were talking about the um, ambient CO2? Yes. Increase? 
Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely for, for C3 plants, we'll, we'll definitely see an, you know potential increase in terms of um, photosynthesis from that elevated CO2. The problems that we've you know seen previously that we're further characterizing in our work um, is just that you know you, you see this initial boost in um, photosynthesis, but that over time, you know, for many of these crops, less than a week or a week, you see that that initial boost in photosynthesis actually starts to acclimate down, and the plants are um, operating at a very similar photosynthetic rate than what you'd have under a normal ambient condition, and so. You know, I, I think that it's very likely plants will definitely adapt, just like we're seeing in a controlled environment, they do adapt. Um, and so that's why, you know, looking at how plants are adapting, we can better understand how they will adapt in the a field environment, but for the controlled environment, really understanding, okay, if we know that they're going to adapt in this way, we know they're going to acclimate, are there things that we can do to try to overcome that acclimation? And if that's the case, you know, does that provide a benefit to production? And so, um, yeah, hopefully that, that at least gets around to answering your question in terms of how plants will act, because I think it definitely will in terms of a field environment. And we definitely are seeing that in the controlled environment, um, just on a very short term scale of even just a four week production period. Sure. Uh, yeah, the other thing, I, we don't need to answer now, but I thought I was very interested you mentioned at the end, uh, using the uh, virtual real reality for educational efforts. Uh, I think that's very interesting, especially with these limitations. One thing, I just, it's a quick comment. Uh, you mentioned about the students, but I see this is a great benefit for continue ed or micro credentials. People who are already working in the industry, they want to learn something new, right? But they cannot go from where we are to Colorado State University. Or there is something they want to learn. It's not physically close to where they are. Uh, that could really open an opportunity for the entire industry. So uh, hopefully I have time to go back to this later. Just a quick comment uh, and hopefully can get people excited about that and, and create connections later. Uh, so then we have Garrett, I think uh, you mentioned so much about our extension efforts uh, and, and very interesting that we've been doing this right since undergrad with, with the Owens Greenhouse. That was super nice to see. So what are your thoughts about, right, the extension. One thing we see, uh, especially with Glades, we have some uh, industry members and we try to work in the industry. Part of our big mission uh, is to facilitate that knowledge and technology transfer. Uh, but sometimes you see a big gap between what we can do at the university and what growers are already using for several reasons, right? Technical limitations, knowledge limitation, sometimes it's more expensive than they want to. There's no awareness. What are your thoughts about how we can collectively optimize this process and bring, fill this gap between what we can do at the university and what can be applied in the industry. I think it's really first understanding what all the growers are capable of doing because working within extension, you come across, you know, growers that just need the basic knowledge versus growers that, you know, have that intermediate knowledge, you know, in technologies, but with the correct information, we could take them collectively to an advanced level of greenhouse production and expand their knowledge. But I think it first really comes down to understanding where they are in terms of their knowledge bases and also what technologies that they have available for them. So for example, there's a lot of Amish and Mennonite communities in the state of Kentucky and just trying to get information out to them and the technologies that they can use and adapt to their greenhouse facilities has been a challenge, but it's something that we do plan to overcome to help move them forward as well. Perfect, thanks. Next question for Xu Yang. Uh, talk about far red light. Uh, now there is even the, right, the response paper to the DOC. One of the questions that came to the chat box uh, was about UV. And you mentioned that you are looking into UV aspects now. So the general question is, uh, is UV being considered uh, to become part of the photosynthetic active radiation spectrum or definition? Uh, is that too early? Uh, what do you see as in that field as UV being considered par at some point? Um, I think the paper right now we are only talking about 400 to 750 not UV because for one thing uh, we would like to solve one problem at a time the other is like this definition is trying to focus on really the photosynthetic effect right now UV most of the studies on how UV affect like plant growth morphology like secondary metabolite there are some initial data on UV photon photosynthesis, um, but I feel like from a 
the data we have right now, we know they have some photosynthetic activity, but not as high as the rest of the spectrum. So um, maybe with more research and better understanding, we can decide whether we wanted to maybe assign some weighted um, efficiency factor when we think about the UV photons. Um, but I think for them to be included in the definition, uh, one thing is they have to show pretty good photosynthetic efficiency. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, William, you talk about uh, how close you are located to several uh, urban centers. So Delaware, right? We're right there, uh, close to so many urban centers. Uh, and the capacity that you have uh, to do the light quality. Uh, so lots of things related to indoor farm. You mentioned you're exploring the greenhouse as well, but you have all well equipped for the indoor production today. Uh, how do you see this role of the research in supporting uh, the indoor farm industry? What, based on your experience, what are the next bottlenecks to help the industry to become more sustainable, widespread and really support their needs? Thanks, Erico. I think one of the most important things, as many of us have mentioned, is resource use efficiency, whether it's water or energy. With my focus in research being on lighting applications, I would like to you know, figure out ways that are um, efficient in, our, in, in the way we use light you know, for growing our crops in the indoor environment and also for greenhouse applications. And I think now uh, there are more and more interests uh, in getting the best of both worlds for indoor crop production and greenhouse crop production. We can talk about potentially propagating seedlings in the indoor environment uh, and then eventually optimize the greenhouse environment uh, in, a, in, in a different way, in a different location. Um, so, you know, having some kind of a hybrid system where we can optimize plant growth and quality in each phase, depending on what the optimum um, traits that we are looking for in each stage, I think that's really important to figure out. So far, a lot of research for indoor vertical farming has been focused on individual discrete parameters. And you know, as Shu Yang has mentioned, and what I'm interested in doing as well, is to figure out how all these parameters can synergistically improve crop production in the indoor environment instead of just looking at individual parameters. We've you know, uh, done some research looking at light intensity and light quality or light intensity and duration, um, like what you know, UT and Kelly have done already. Um, but when it comes to the interaction between light and other environmental factors, I think we're still um, getting to the understanding of how everything works together and how we can optimize everything um, synergistically. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, now to Kelly. Uh, Kelly, you mentioned uh, some of your work with quality. Uh, you mentioned some where right, we saw some of the, the images, uh, the HPLC that you have, you got the extracts, the colors are very nice. Uh, that's something that we see sometimes with the industry. Uh, if you wanna quantify the energy savings, for example, we can put your finger there and say, oh, you save this amount of money. Uh, if you want to reduce crop cycle time, you can measure in number of days. When you're talking about crop quality, we all know it's a huge benefit. And I think bottom line, that's what the growers want. They want a sellable uh, right, product. It, it could be color, could be biomass, could be size. Uh, it can be bigger, can be smaller, depending on the applications. How do you see the challenge? How we overcome the challenge when you're talking to the industry about conveying the importance of quality, which I guess not really the question. The question is, uh, how to measure quality? What, what is the best way you learn over time when you talk to the growers? If you can share with us how, how to make this measurable unit, which is not always measurable when you're talking to growers and industry stakeholders. Yeah, so I think, you know, we, we all of us have been talking about how to, you know, improve production efficiencies and all of these interactions. And, you know, the bottom line is it's complicated enough with just, you know, optimizing yield. And then adding that whole quality aspect on top of it makes it even more complicated. Um, but one of the goals of mine is to start, you know, systematically evaluating, you know, if you pull this lever, what happens with, you know, these sec different secondary metabolites of interest? Um, and part of that is collaborating with, you know, 
ag economists, you know, marketing people, um, food scientists specializing in sensory preferences to help characterize, okay, what compounds should we be you know, optimizing what is too much, you know, what exactly do we need? And I think one main advantage of controlled environment production is that we can, um, you know, control the environment so precisely, uh, but what, what targets do we need? What do we need to target? So that's what we're hoping, you know, to establish. And, you know, why, why does my basil taste different when I grow it in the greenhouse in the winter versus the summer. So helping, you know, hash out some of those questions to improve consistency and providing a consistently um, premium quality crop. I can't remember your whole question. I know sometimes I get off on a tangent. Was, was there another part to that or? No, it was about that. So it's right. Uh, really, the question was about the complexity uh, of, you know, measure and, and specifically point out the quality, but I think your answer really covers that. <laughs> it is it's not easy, it's, it's complex, so many things involve it. Uh, so I think you certainly covered that. Uh, nice, so we got, uh, I'm surprised here that the amount of, of comments and questions we got about uh, other people saying, how can we support your work? Uh, so I got some uh, more senior researchers here and industry focus saying, so just a few examples, uh, from AJ Bolt, if there's anything uh, your more senior colleagues can do to help, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, then we got a comment from Eric Runkel. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all online. Great job, uh, each and every one of you. The future of CA is indeed very bright, pun intended. So just so as you guys know about that, uh, coming from Eric, not from me. And then another, uh, another comment from New Madsen, super impressive presentations, a broader question. Are there things that CEA industry can do to support you in your work? Uh, is there a need for National CEA Industry Trade Associate that could help advocate for the industry and prioritize support research? Uh, so I think in general, right, the spirit of those comments is, uh, let's look for collaborations. Uh, great to see the good work that all of you are doing, the interesting work, different areas of research here. Um, any final thoughts? We're getting close to one, two minutes here. Uh, I would open for all of you, and we can stay five, 10 more minutes. Uh, if you guys are available, we can certainly do that. Uh, what are your general thoughts about seeing the others presenting? I know you know each other already, uh, but any other thoughts? What comes to mind? I think as far as collaborations, let's try to focus on that. How do you think uh, we could take this opportunity to open for collaborations? And, and one last thing, someone asked here if you guys would be willing to share your contacts. I think everyone presented the contacts here, uh, but I can certainly, on the follow-up email from this webinar, I can include all of yours, right, email and some information, a link or something like this. Uh, I don't think there'll be any problem. But so to open the floor uh, for all of you, uh, what do you think would be good opportunities for collaboration or not a specific point? So how can we do that? Academic to academic, academic to industry, extension, industry associations, anything that comes to mind you'd like to talk about this topic, this broad topic? So I have a, a couple of thoughts. Um, Neil, when you brought up that industry association, it makes me think of you know, the American Floral Endowment. Maybe we could have something like the American Floral Endowment for this you know, CEA industry. Um, they have you know, scholarships for students because I know, you know training the, the next generation of you know, growers is an issue and we need more growers all the time. So scholarships to help with, with that um, area and also potentially some seed grant funding um, so we can you know, have some funding for, for pre preliminary research so we can all be more competitive for larger federal collaborative grants. Uh, quick comment there, Kelly. I think if we have industry focus listening to that, uh, it will be a parallel for the seed funding, right? If you have companies who wants to try new things, uh, new development, new hypotheses, uh, I think we can achieve very tangible things and good outcomes with not a huge amount of money, but can open, really can open the doors for a huge amount of money later on, uh, which could be a win-win, I guess, for the researchers and the companies as well. So if the companies are listening, lots of opportunities. Anyone else, any thoughts about this big topic? Cool. So uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone for joining the webinar today. Uh, huge spe uh, special thank you for all of you. 
the speakers. Uh, it was great uh, to see you all together here today. I hope we can do this again. Uh, maybe next year we can do a follow-up call. Uh, we can see where we are, new things that we are doing. Uh, so if that's okay, I will go ahead and I will share uh, all your contacts with the audience today. Uh, and then we got more people. We got about twice or almost three times the people that registered but did not show up and they will get these as well. If they register, there's certainly interest, uh, but things happen. They can always or not always join. Um, any other follow-ups that you have, uh, please reach out to me and then I can make the connection the other way around. So thanks again for joining everyone. I hope we get, uh, have a good rest of the day and I look forward to seeing you in person when we start to travel again. Uh, would be great. So then you can have a real round table. Right now I see a, a checkboard table in my front here <laughs> with my Zoom window. So hopefully you can have a real round table uh, within the next near future. Thanks everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.